Dankeschön und guten Morgen. My name is Mikko. And I hunt hackers. That's my job. And when I say hackers, I don't mean you guys. So I know we, many of us, identify as hackers. When I say I hunt hackers, I mean the criminals, the people who write malware and run the botnets and send the spam and create the malicious exploits and do all the things we don't want to be happening on our computers. And I've been doing this all my life. In fact, my mother, Rauha, went to work with the Finnish State Computing Center in Helsinki in 1966. 66. Nobody was working with computers in 1966, but my mother was. She went to work there with the mainframes of the time, computers which were the size of a room, and when she would bring home work or something to work with while she was at home, she would be bringing home punch tape and punch cards. These. This is how we used to store data. There's holes in this piece of paper, uh, roughly 60 bits stored on a piece of paper, and you would have a stack of these and you would run them through a sorting machine to get your code on a piece of computer. So when I was a small child, me and my brothers would be playing around the house with punch cards and punch tape. So it's no wonder that uh, when I then went to work, just give me a second, when I went to work with, uh, um, when I went to study, I was always interested in computers and we got a home computer fairly early on. Of course, a Commodore 64, of course. And it didn't take me very long to quit playing games on the Commodore 64 and, and want to start making my own games. The limitations of the machine were pretty obvious. In fact, Commodore 64 CPU processing speed is one megahertz. One mega, actually a little bit less than one megahertz. If any of you used to program Commodore 64s and VIC-20s, the earlier brother of Commodore 64, in fact, VIC-20 is actually a little bit faster. The CPU in a VIC-20 is, is I, I believe it's a little bit over one megahertz, and in 64 it's a little bit less than one megahertz. In fact, the floppy drive right there, 1541, has exactly the same CPU as the main computer. This is how this is how, how stupidly slow these computers were. So we wanted to make games, me and my brothers, and we did. Here's a game I wrote in 1987 with my brother Ari. It's called Paha Juttu, Seikkailu Peli Kaiken Ikäisille. <laughs> which is actually a split screen adventure game where you have a split screen going all the way into the borders, you have high resolution graphics on the upper part and then <laughs> Then you have a Finnish language interpreter in the bottom part where you would type what you want to do. Go west, take a lamp, light up the torch, adventure around in a adventure world. And these actually got published in Finland. So I sold my first games, my first software products when I was 16 years old. That's how I, I started in, in computing. And I'm really glad I had a chance to tell my mother before she died that, um, thanks, good call. When I was 18 years old, she sat me down on a kitchen table and told me that, you know, Mikko, you should go and study telecommunications. Telecommunications is the future. And I think that's a pretty good call, because this is 1988 or, or 1987. I mean, this is years and years before the internet, before the web, before mobile phones, before any of that. And for once, I listened to my mother, and I did go and study telecommunications and computers. So what happened with the game? Well, 
earlier this year, I was contacted by officials from the city of Tampere, the second largest city in Finland, because they have a museum, a game museum, and they wanted to put my game in the permanent exhibition. And that's where it is today. If you're traveling in Finland, I suggest you go to the game museum and you will find an exhibition called Paha Juttu, Seikkailu peli kaiken ikäisille. <laughs> where you can actually play the game with an emulator. It's a PC running a Commodore 64 emulator. They have the original floppies, the development floppies, the original assembly language machine, um, machine language monitor I used to write the code, map of the game, a ADDA modified. This is what we used to make sound, actually speech for the game. The game has four channel sound, which is pretty neat because Commodore 64 only has three channels. And it speaks to you, which is pretty neat. So yeah, that's what I would recommend you do. In fact, yesterday, as I landed to Frankfurt, I rented a car, and before I drove to here to Heidelberg, I actually went to Schergenstad, which has a Flipper und Argade Museum. I highly recommend you visit that place as well. They, they have uh, 110 video games and pinballs. But how is all this related to where we are today? Well, to write these early games, you really had to do it in machine language. We weren't using, I mean, when I wrote these early programs, I wasn't actually doing assembly. I was really doing machine language. What I mean by that is that I didn't write code and, and, and use a assembler to compile it. I actually used a, a, a machine language monitor to write this stuff straight to memory which means when you had to move things around, some part of code got too big, it wouldn't fit where you wanted it to be, and you had to move it around, then you had to manually change all the chumps, because you weren't compiling it, you were just patching it in memory. And this, became, this skill became useful later, when I went to study, and I needed a source of income, so I was looking for a place to work, and eventually I joined this small startup called Data Fellows. I was employee number six in this small startup, which did all kinds of things, including security. And then when we started getting samples of early viruses on floppy disks, we needed someone who would be able to decode them. And my boss, Risto, he handed one of these to me and said, you know, you've been doing assembler. You probably can decode these viruses. Take a look. This was in 1991, and I took a look. And of course, this is 6510 assembler. This is PCs, MS-DOS, so it's x86. It's a bit, si bit similar, but a bit different. But of course, you can figure it out if you take the time, and I took the time. And I started analyzing MS-DOS viruses in 1991. And that's basically what I'm still doing today in 2018. Still looking at the kinds of attacks we're seeing today, trying to figure out where we're going, trying to figure out how the attacks are evolving, trying to figure out how we can secure our systems against these attacks. The company I joined in 1991, Data Fellows, started getting bigger, eventually started focusing only in security, eventually the company renamed itself from Data Fellows to F-Secure. I'm still there, 27 years later. I'm still working at that small startup that I went to work at when I was studying at the university. Today we have 1,600 people. We operate in 29 countries around the world. Our German headquarters are in Munich. We do a lot of work, but it's still the same company. And if there's any advice I can give to you, don't take career advice from me. It's a bad idea to work at the same company for 27 years. <laughs> you really should be changing your employer every five to 10 years. You probably get a raise every time you change a company. I think, because I've never changed a company. Don't do what I do. However, I've never had a boring day at work. 27 years with the same company, I've never had a boring day at work. Our work keeps changing, our work keeps evolving. And I guess the most important lesson I've learned is that if we want to be able to 
defend our systems. If we want to be able to analyze the attacks, we have to understand the enemy. We have to understand who the people are who create these attacks. Who are these people? Where are they from? Why are they doing what they're doing? Guys like this. Boris from St. Petersburg. Guys who run organized crime gangs, run botnets, run banking Trojans, ransom Trojans, keyloggers, guys who make a lot of money with their attacks. And for attacker, this job is fairly easy. They always have an upper hand. We defenders have to succeed every time. Attackers can just keep trying. If they fail, it doesn't matter, they'll try again. Eventually, they will get in. And they have unlimited time to look at our defenses. If you are creating a new exploit against a vulnerability, against a bug in the code, all you have to do is go and download all the security products that are trying to stop you and try if they succeed or not. So for example, if you're writing a piece of malware, when your piece of malware is ready, what do you do? Well, you go and download all the antiviruses. And you scan your piece of, piece of malware. And you know what? Most likely, it's going to be detected by generic detections built into different systems. So then you modify it. You recompile it with a different compiler. You add a layer of obfuscation. You add a layer of encryption. And you scan it again. If it's still detected, you add more layers until it's not. Attackers have unlimited time to do this. And we defenders, we don't. We have to be able to detect and block every single attack as soon as they're created, or very, very soon afterwards. It's not a fair fight between malware writers and malware fighters when the malware writers have access to our weapons. This is why it's such a hard work. Security is hard. That's why some of the brightest minds in technology choose to work in security. When I speak with our developers, our analysts, our reverse engineers, I'm always amazed about the level of skill and dedication we have, not just in our company, but in security in general. And I believe it's because people think that this work matters. Like, if you're a really good developer, really good reverse engineer, you can work in any area of IT. You can go and, and write games or, I don't know, CRM systems or uh, operating systems or backend systems or virtualization platforms. You can, you can work in any of those. But when you work in security, what you're actually doing very directly is that you're helping people. Like when, when companies and, and individuals call us, they're very concretely asking for help. My computer has been taken over. Help me. I've lost my photos, my memories, my data. Help me. And when we can help them, it feels good. It feels like our job matters. Sure, the same people could be writing games. And games are fun. I love games. But there is a difference here. And of course, security companies are businesses. We're trying to make a profit here. But it's just a little bit more than just making profit. It's also about helping people. And this is also why security companies do surprisingly large amounts of cooperation. Yes, security companies are competing with each other for the same market, for the same money. But our low-level developers and analysts and reverse engineers work together with similar guys from Symantec, McAfee, Kaspersky, Avira, GData, all these companies. We, we share samples, we share information, we sit on the same mailing lists, we ask each other for help, and we help each other. Why? Because we are fighting the same enemy. If you work for 
a game company. Who's your enemy? Your enemy are the other companies, the competitors. When you work in security, you have a very concrete enemy, the people you're trying to defend your customers against. And of course, our sales and marketing people still hate the sales and marketing people of the competitors, of course. <laughs> but when you get to the techies, the geeks and the nerds, we work together. We, we share the same enemy. Now, I told you that attackers, you know, they can keep retrying. They only have to succeed once, and we have to succeed every time. But there's also a reverse for that. If an online criminal wants to stay uncaught, they have to succeed every time. They can't make a single mistake. I've worked with many cases over the years where we've, we've taken criminal hackers into court. We found them, we've worked with law enforcement, we've taken them into court, we've put these people into jail. And almost always the story on how they were caught was that they made a single mistake. Once logging into an IRC chat without using Tor or a VPN or some anonymizing proxy, revealing their real IP address for once. That's enough. And attackers have a hard time bringing the profits they make into the real world. It's fairly easy to gain access to large amounts of passwords or large amounts of credit card numbers or large amounts of bank, uh, bank accounts. That's not hard. You can actually go to Tor Hidden Service, look for the right forum, and you can just buy 10,000 credit card numbers, 10,000 bank accounts, 10,000 Amazon accounts. You can buy all this. That's easy. The trick is, the, the hard part is, if you have 10,000 credit card numbers, how do you convert those credit card numbers into a Land Cruiser or a, a, a Ferrari? Like, how do you actually do that without getting caught? And this is harder than you would think. Like, how do you actually anonymize the money? How do you move it without getting caught? It's easy to move it if you don't worry about getting caught. But of course, these guys don't want to get caught. And this is the choking point. This is where we can like, limit the activity of the criminals. This is the hard part for them. And they've come up with creative ways in, in trying to get the money out from the virtual world into the real world without getting caught. So for example, the Carburb <coughs> banking Trojan network were doing this to get the money out. This is security camera footage from an ATM. Look at the ATM. Nobody's touching it, and suddenly it's spitting out money because it's hacked. This guy is a money mule. He's there because he knows it's going to spit out money. He takes the money out. He even has a bag for the money. Look at that. Then he takes out his phone, and he orders more money. This is how they're laundering the profits from the bank accounts they gained access to. This is the choking point in action. And yes, they can empty a single ATM. They're going to get 30,000 to 50,000 euros. That's, that's a lot of money, but it's not that much. It's not enough to buy a Ferrari, right? The accounts they hold, the accounts they have hold millions of euros, but they can't get out millions of euros from ATMs. They can maybe make a few hundreds of thousands of euros this way by targeting a large amount of ATMs. But this is the problem they have. And this is the reason why we are now seeing a very clear shift in the attacks from traditional targets into cryptocurrency targets. Because today, money is data. And this is especially true with Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Monero, Zcash, all these new virtual currencies based on, yes, based on blockchain. And yes, blockchain and Bitcoin are in the middle of the Gartner hype curves bottom levels. I mean, this used to be all the rage. Blockchain is going to change everything, and now everybody laughs at the idea. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. There are actually real useful things that can be done with these things, but it's going to take a while before we actually see the realization of what can be done. But the practical things that are being done today with cryptocurrencies is that there's a lot of crime. 
Now, real world criminals love cash. Online criminals love Bitcoin. That doesn't mean that cash would be bad or illegal, just like Bitcoin isn't bad or illegal. They're tools, tools which can be used for, for good or bad. In the real world, it's kind of hard to go and buy cocaine with a credit card. Or so I've been told. <laughs> exactly in the same way, in the online world, it's kind of hard to go and buy cocaine from a Tor Hidden Service um, without using anything else than cryptocurrencies. But many of the same attackers which were targeting online banks or online um, stores are now targeting cryptocurrency exchanges and cryptocurrency wallets. Because it makes a lot of sense from their point of view. And in fact, if you look at the list of cryptocurrency exchanges which have been hacked over the last five years, there's plenty of them. The largest thefts here are in the hundreds of millions of euros. Let's pause here. Hundreds of millions of euros. Nobody has hundreds of millions of euros except banks. And that's what these are. Cryptocurrency exchanges from the point of view of the attackers are banks with one huge difference. Traditional banks have been operating for 100 years. They have thousands of employees. Their security team has dozens of people who've been working in security for 10 years. That's a hard target. The amount of money they hold is in the hundreds of millions of euros, just like these. But these haven't been operating for 100 years. These are startups. They've been operating for three years. The whole company has 25 employees. This is an easy target. And the best part, if they get in, if they get in, then the money is already anonymized. It's already untrackable. It's already laundered. They can actually go and take the bitcoins and buy that Ferrari. Because you can buy a Ferrari with bitcoins. You don't have to move it to the euros or rubles or anything else. And they can't be found. No choking point. This is why we're seeing this shift. And for many companies, for many organizations, for most of you in the audience, this is good news. Because most of us work with traditional businesses, online stores and banks and traditional real world companies. So the more the attackers move from these traditional targets to these targets, the better it is for most of us, right? This is good news. So how come there is no choking point? Well, it's because of the blockchain. And then the next good question is, how come we can't track the blockchain? Because after all, blockchain, as probably all here know, is a public ledger. Public ledger of transactions. Anything you put in the blockchain, well, blockchains like the Bitcoin blockchain, anything you put in there is going to be public forever and unchangeable forever. That's the way it works. So if it's public, we can see all the transactions. And that's actually true. You can go and download the Bitcoin blockchain today. And it has every single transaction for the last 10 years. The first transaction was done in December 2008, so 10 years ago. And you can see every single transaction. So how come we can't follow the money? How come we can't see where the money goes? Well, it's because this. This is a visualization of the wallet where the ransom payments for the Petya Trojan were paid. Petya, the ransom Trojan. On the 13th of July, the Russians, <coughs> the unknown attackers, <laughs> sorry. The unknown attackers moved the money from the original wallet to six new wallets. And we can see this because this is the Bitcoin blockchain. It's public. You can see this. Just download the blockchain and look at the transactions. Look at the wallet where the ransoms were paid. You will see every ransom being paid, and you will see where the money goes. Now, you don't see who pays, but you will see the transactions. So all we have to do 
to find the attackers is to follow the money. Where does the money go? Eventually, it's going to go to an exchange, right? And it's going to be changed into rubles or euros or dollars, right? Right? Well, this is the 13th of July. On the 14th of the July, they started moving the money from these accounts to these accounts. And this went on for several days. Then they started moving the money from Bitcoin blockchain to Monero blockchain. And Monero blockchain can be used in double blind mode, which means we can't follow the money. We don't know where the money went. Most likely it went to Monero and straight back to Bitcoin and then into a Ferrari. And we don't know where it went. No choking point. This is why the criminals love cryptocurrencies. And this is why we've seen this massive growth in ransomware Trojans, our ransomware map doesn't even fit to a single slide anymore. There's more than 300 gangs making all of their money with ransom Trojans. Then we see rogue mining, using other people's computers to do mining, which is a really interesting attack from the point of view of the attacker, even more interesting from the point of view of the victim. Like, what are you losing when your computer is doing mining for a criminal? You're lo losing CPU cycles. You're losing electricity, basically. For most victims, this is a relief. Like when we you know, tell a victim that, unfortunately, your systems have been infected with a criminal Trojan. And they're like, oh my god, what did it do? Did it steal my credit card number? Did it steal my bank account? No. It was using your electricity. OK. <laughs> we are seeing crypto checking attacks, which are the kinds of attacks where attackers take over websites, install a JavaScript snippet, which will then use the browser to do mining. And this sounds ridiculous, but actually it's not. They can actually make money. They cannot mine Bitcoin. Bitcoin is way, way too hard to mine. They can mine coins like GSE coin, which is JavaScript coin, made exactly for this purpose. Um, Litecoin, many other altcoins can be mined, which makes money. And that's pretty creative. You have to respect the creativity of our enemies. I mean, I often say that our job would be so easy if our enemies would be stupid. But they're not stupid. I'll give you an example. Last January, we were working with a US client in, in, in Washington, which was being targeted by a nation state. This is a defense contractor, the kind of target that gets targeted by the toughest attacks, foreign intelligence agencies, foreign militaries. And they knew they were a target. So they had closed down the hatches. They had top level security. They had trained all their peoples. They saw attacks coming in all the time, but they weren't getting in. The attackers were getting frustrated. No matter what they did, they couldn't get in. They tried port scanning their network to find VPN endpoints or vulnerable systems. They didn't find any. They tried sending in um, malicious Word document files with exploits in them, hoping users would open them. They didn't open them. They sent in PDF files with exploits. They didn't open them either. They were trying to send them emails with links to websites which would have exploits, which would take over the browser to get in. Users weren't clicking on the links. Right? The ideal situation. Then the attackers tried one last trick which is that they emailed a couple of key employees with a very simple, very short email, which was a thank you email. An email which simply said, dear recipient, thank you for subscribing to our mailing list. From now on, we will be sending you an exciting mail every day. <laughs> Best regards. You porn. <laughs> now imagine yourself being at your workplace, sitting at your computer, getting a mailing list announcement from a porn site. You're like, holy hell, like, did anybody see it? Like, who, who subscribed me here? 
where's the unsubscribe link? There, and they click the unsubscribe link, takes them to a website, exploit, ban. Our work would be easy if the enemy would be stupid. They're not stupid, they're clever guys. They come up with creative ways of fooling the users, creative ways of gaining access to the systems. Now, we do a lot of red teaming and penetration testing. We have guys who do break-ins. I mean, you can hire us into, to break into your network, and then we will break into your network. You can even hire us to physically break into your offices, and then we will break into your offices. But the tests, the kinds of tests you get when you hire a company like us are actually fairly close to the kind of attacks these guys do. And by the way, look at these guys march. They're pretty good. I mean, I've seen your army march. It doesn't look like this. <laughs> so when you hire a company to do a red teaming exercise or do a penetration test, that company will then start targeting your network. And they will not give up. Like when we're hired to break into a company, we will try all the usual tricks. If we can't get in, we bring in more guys. Try again. Let's figure out. Okay, they, they're not clicking on those. Okay, let's try this. It's not working. All right. Let's, let's send them physical USB thumb drives in the mail. Let's see if that works. Didn't work. Okay, let's get, get a guy in a suit who walks in and sits down at a computer. If that doesn't work, let's try something else. We will try and try until we get in. That's a persistent attack. And this is not a normal attack. Because normal attacks, most of the attacks, are being done by criminals, people who want to make money. And money-making criminals are looking for the low-hanging fruit. And the internet is a garden full of low-hanging fruit. If they're looking for money and they try getting into an organization and it's too hard, they will forget about it and go after someone else. So you don't have to have perfect security to fight Criminal attackers just have to have better security than the other companies, <laughs> right? But when you're fighting these guys, they're not giving up. Like they've been given a mission. They're working for a foreign intelligence agency. A general has told them that we need this information. The information is in that company. They will try getting into that company until they get in, because that's what they were told to do. I mean, they're not going to change their mind that it's, this is too hard. I'm going to go and hack some other company. <laughs> So this is, this is what you get. When you hire a penetration test, you're actually getting tested against this kind of attacks. And that's very good if you're fighting governmental attackers. But most companies are not. Foreign intelligence agencies only target very specific organizations. They're not going to target most of you. To be targeted by a foreign intelligence agency, you have to be doing something pretty interesting like a defense contractor or some you know, high-level R&D stuff. If you work for, I don't know, a restaurant chain, a pizza chain, you're never going to be targeted by Russian intelligence. They're not going to hack in to steal your recipes. <laughs> no matter how good your pizzas are, they're not going to hack in to steal your recipes. But if you work for a pizza restaurant chain, you do have to worry about criminals because you do have payroll information, online banking systems, credit card information. That's very interesting to criminals. So you have to think about your enemy. Like, who are we? What do we do? Who might want to hack us? Who might want to hurt us? Who might want to embarrass us? And then you start building your defenses against the enemy that's most likely to hit you. For some organization, it is this. For some organization, it's not. Now, whenever we speak about governmental attacks, we keep getting back to Russia and China. And Russia and China are obviously very active with offensive cyber attacks. That's, that's a fact. But there's also a huge difference in the visibility Russia and China has against the rest of the internet. It's actually quite surprising. When you think about Russia, Russia is a big country. It's the biggest country on the planet. They have a huge amount of people. They have some of the best technical universities in the world. Massive amount of mathematicians and physicists and low-level coders and developers. 
It's actually a bit surprising that there are no Russian technology products that we would know. None of us are using Russian IT services or tech. We don't have any Russian technology in our pockets, unless somebody has a Kalashnikov in, in their pocket. <laughs> but then when you look at China, we can all name like five Chinese tech companies right away, like, you know, Lenovo, ZTE, Huawei, OnePlus, Xiaomi. We all have Chinese technology in our pockets right now. And yes, China is bigger. They have almost 10 times more people than Russia. But still, it's quite surprising that Russia is unable to produce technology success stories for the rest of the world. The biggest technology success story out of Russia is Tetris. <laughs> That's the one we all know. And that was 30 years ago. So there's a huge difference in visibility. Nevertheless, Russia is very active in their attacks. The biggest and most expensive computer security incident in history happened last year, the NotPetya attack, targeting one country on the planet, targeting Ukraine. Why Ukraine? Because Russia is at war with Ukraine. So when two countries are at war, and one of the countries launches computer-based attacks targeting the infrastructure of the other country. That's what we call cyber war. Most of the times when you read the term cyber war, cyber war from newspapers, it's not cyber war. It's, you know, spying or, you know, whatever, which is not war. But this is war. So how did Russia target one country? How did they target Ukraine in the NotPetya attack last July. Well, they did it by hacking into a software developer in Kyiv, in Ukraine, a company which was developing a financial software called MEDOC, which is the de facto standard financial bookkeeping software in Ukraine, used basically by all Ukrainian companies because this is the way you file your taxes to the government of Ukraine. You as a company, you file your taxes by running this software and submitting your tax reports to the government. So they hacked the update servers of the company creating MEDOC. And on 29th of June last year, they shipped an update, an extra update, which was not Petya. So if you were running this piece of software on the 29th of June, you got infected by this piece of malware. And then it started spreading like wildfire in your network trying to steal admin credentials and then using standard Windows features which enable users to run programs on other people's computers. If it gained normal user privileges, it might be able to gain access to a couple of workstations. If it gets some admin privileges, it's much worse. If it gets domain admin, it's game over. And this is what happened across Ukraine. Basically all banks were hit in Ukraine, basically all um, Superstores and, and uh, uh, store chains were shut down in the middle of the day because all their computers were overwritten by NotPetya. NotPetya overwrites the master boot record, the first sector on the first side of the first hard drive in the system, the very first code which is executed when you boot up a PC. So when you get hit by Petya and you start the computer, it doesn't even start. It doesn't load any operating system. However, last June, last July, the story we heard in mainstream media about this attack was not about Ukraine. The story we heard was about Western companies getting hit by this attack. Companies here in Europe, in Asia, and in the United States. And these companies have nothing to do with Ukraine. They are not Ukrainian companies. Why were they getting hit by this attack, which was targeting one country? Well, even though they are not Ukrainian companies, they are global companies. These companies work in every country on the planet. For example, Maersk from Denmark. Every fifth container on the planet is being shipped by Maersk. They ship these into 
over 200 countries on the planet, including Ukraine. And if your company does business all over the world, it has to file taxes all over the world. If you do business in Ukraine, you have to file taxes in Ukraine. And if your company has to file taxes in Ukraine, you do it with ME Doc, which means you have at least one workstation in your network which is running ME Doc. And if you had one workstation in your network running ME Doc on 29th of June, you got infected. This is what happened to these companies. So was this collateral damage? Was this an accident? Maybe. There's another theory, which is that this was not an accident, that this was exactly what the Russians wanted to do. They wanted to send a message. And the message is, don't do business in Ukraine. If you do business in Ukraine, we will fuck you up. And companies don't expect to get hit like this. If, if these companies would have asked me for advice before this attack, if they would have asked me that, hey, we're running this bookkeeping software, which we have to run because we have to file taxes to the government with this software, and the default setting is to have automatic updates enabled, is that a good idea? I would have told them yes. Yes, that's a good idea. Because for 10 years, we've been telling companies to update their stuff. Patch immediately. Update your system. It makes you more secure. We're here. In this case, it was the updates which burned these companies. Nobody expects to get hit by an attack because they're running a bookkeeping software. Another example. Six weeks ago, Ticketmaster was hit by a massive credit card breach where users were losing their credit card numbers as they were buying tickets on the Ticketmaster website. <coughs> How did they get hit? Because they were using a chatbot. You know these chat windows which pop up from the corner of the browser when you go to a website. Hey, how can I help you? You can help me by going away. <laughs> they didn't create this chatbot by themselves. They bought it from a third party, from a company called Inventa. And Inventa got hacked. And of course, the way this chatbot is implemented is that it's one line of JavaScript that you insert into, into, your, into your pages. And Ticketmaster had inserted this chatbot into every page on their website. And when I say every page, I mean every page, including the checkout pages, the pages where you type in the credit card number. <laughs> Nobody expects to get hit because they're running a chatbot. Or how about case of Target, one of the largest credit card bridges in history from six years ago, where customers of Target who were shopping in real world stores lost their credit card number as they were showing their credit card to the cashier using the official credit card terminal in a physical shop. How did, the, how did the attackers get in? The attackers got in through the ventilation system. And when I say ventilation system, I don't mean Bruce Willis or Tom Cruise crawling in. <laughs> I mean that they got in through the computers controlling the ventilation systems. The ventilation system in this building is run by something like this. Although here in Germany, it's most likely made by Siemens. But nevertheless, something like this. Because these are Linux servers. They don't look like Linux servers, but they are. The attackers hacked the ventilation and refrigeration system of Target. Then they used lateral movement to gain access from there to their financial network, from there to the credit card terminals. Nobody expects to get hit by hackers getting in through the ventilation systems. But that's exactly what happened. And we're seeing more and more botnets, which are not infecting computers at all, but instead are infecting security cameras and smart doorbells and heat pumps and ICS systems. Botnets which only infect connected devices, including the Mirai attack, which we saw around a year and a half ago. Mirai, there's now 40 different versions of Mirai. But when we saw the original one, the first one, it was very interesting because it was used to create a global botnet, which was then launching a denial of service attack 
targeting the second largest DNS provider on the planet. And when DNS breaks, the internet breaks. Nothing works. I mean, everything still works if you remember IP addresses for everything. But who, how many of you remember the IP address for Google, for example? Oh, you guys. <laughs> Do you work for Google? <laughs> I actually have, have it written down. I have a piece of text file on my computer which has an IP address where you can use Google through an IP address if name services break. But these kind of attacks are getting more and more common. Attackers are creating more and more attacks which are not targeting traditional computers at all. And today, all companies are software companies. It doesn't matter what a company does anymore. The difference between successful and unsuccessful companies is how good they are in digitalization. This change has already happened. This means that computer security should be a board level topic in every company. And I can tell you, it isn't a board level topic in all the companies. Computer security right now becomes a board level topic only when there's been a breach. Or maybe there's been some big case in the news like WannaCry. Then it maybe becomes a board level topic in companies for one meeting. And that's not good enough. It should be a permanent topic. The CISO or CIO should be in every board meeting briefing on the security state of the company. But I can understand why it's not. You look at the average board member of a large company, these are people in their 60s, typically men in their 60s. These are not digital natives. These are not people who are comfortable around topics on, of technology and information security. So no wonder it isn't a board level topic when it should be. And we can take every single attack we've ever seen and we can divide all of these attacks into two different groups. They're either technical problems or people problems. In the end, technical problems are vulnerabilities, unpatched systems, bugs in the code. Every single vulnerability is a bug in the code. Programmer, the developer made a mistake and we make mistakes because we are human. Humans make mistakes. We will always have bugs, which means we will always have vulnerabilities. But at least we know how to fight this part of the problem, the technical problem. The way you fight technical problems is that you figure out the bug, you fix the bug, and then you update and patch all the systems. Might be very slow, might be very expensive, but at least we know how to do it. But then we have the other problem, the people problem. Users, goddamn users. <laughs> If you could just get rid of the users. Because users do stupid s stuff. Users do stupid stuff. Like opening every attachment they get in email, clicking on every link, following every link, and giving their password to any field that asks for it. <laughs> and there's no patch for that. We can't patch people. There's no patch for stupidity. And users do stupid stuff, stupid stuff like, I don't know, going to Twitter and posting public tweets where they order pizza. <laughs> I quit. And then, when somebody tells him, hey, that, hey, that's a bad idea, he asks, why? <laughs> Maybe we have no hope. Thank you very much. <laughs>